and as was uh, told to us by Kankwasa, we are landlocked in East Africa. Uh, that's the area about 33 million people. Um, the significance of that is that we've grown from 4.8 million in 1950 to 24 in uh, 2002, and now about 33 million. So you can see that's quite a rapid population growth. And the population is relatively young. Median age, only about 15. So there are lots of young people in Uganda. Um, having said that, we're also one of the world's, world's poorest countries, the so-called least developed countries. Uh, we've been recording relatively high growth rates in recent years. Uh, but uh, despite that, you know, most of the population still lives in the rural areas and they live in poverty. The mes uh, biggest sector is agriculture, of course, which employs about 80% of the workforce. We do have substantial natural resources, um, including recently discovered oil in the Albertine Rift, which everybody is excited about, but uh, which we are not so sure is going to be useful to everybody. Um, the Jane Goodall Institute, of course, uh, was founded by the lady Jane Goodall in 77, um, after she had conducted her research in Gombe, in Tanzania. And uh, the main activities for the organization include research, conservation, uh, protection of primates, and community-centered conservation. We do a lot of public education and awareness, uh, and we have the so-called Roots and Shoots program, which is a, a program to inspire youth. Uh, there's that quotation in blue, if you're interested, if you can read it fast enough, but it is a quotation from Dr. Jane Goodall. Basically, it's around engaging the youth if you are going to conserve the environment and the future. Um, the mission for JGI Uganda is to maintain a stable and viable population of chimpanzees. And we expect that these chimpanzees will live in harmony with the local community. That's a tall order, but that's our mission. We think uh, um, we'd like to achieve that. Now, last year, the Jen Goodall Institute in Uganda was selected by stakeholders who participated in the Masindi meeting, which was alluded to by uh, Dillis, um, to coordinate activities of the local chapter of the Poverty and Conservation Learning Group. Uh, now, as an organization, of course, we focus on chimpanzees, uh, but the PCLG um, has got a broader mandate. We do not, uh, the, the group doesn't focus only on chimpanzees. Uh, its mission is much broader, and it, is, it includes understanding the sort of the interface between um, conservation and poverty, and the fact that there has often been a mismatch between conservationists and policymakers in development. Um, since I said we focus on chimpanzees, I thought I should say something about what threatens chimpanzees in Uganda. The major issue, of course, is poverty. Uh, and of course, the high population growth rates, which I alluded to. The implication of high population growth rates, when you have a population of more than 80% living in rural areas, means that you need more land all the time for the growing population. Uh, that low rate of urbanization means you need land out there for the people. And I said agriculture is the major activity. So certainly you need land to grow whatever you need to grow. Um, and obviously that will, you know, that will mean encroachment in habitats that have been previously occupied by wildlife, including great apes such as chimpanzees and gorillas. Now, humans have this tendency of reacting to situations such as that by uh, getting back at uh, 
the wildlife. So in this case, they can trap and kill the apes. Uh, they can set snares um, of various uh, types. In some case, in the case of Uganda, chimpanzees are not eaten, and other great apes are not eaten either. But people do set snares in forests to catch other species, wild pigs, dikers, um, and other small mammals. And when that happens, the chimpanzees are non-target species. And unlike in West Africa, where I understand chimpanzees have learned the art of removing snares, ours in Uganda haven't. They actually just fight on and fight on until the snare gets tighter and tighter, and eventually they lose their limbs sometimes. Now, I wanted to say something about the policy and legal framework. It's quite comprehensive in Uganda. Uh, it starts from the constitution itself, which gives uh, government the role of trustees. Uh, they hold all natural res resources in Uganda in trust for the people of Uganda and the global community. Um, the current policy does recognize that some of the wildlife can be a problem um, and can cause to, you know, damage to human beings and to their property. Uh, it also recognizes that land use change has been a major driver uh, that has led to an increase in human wildlife conflict. Um, unfortunately, uh, the policy divests management of vermin to local governments, although it recognizes that local governments do not have the capacity to manage vermin. There are certain species that have been categorized as vermin. Not all problem animals are vermin. Um, now, some of the guiding principles of our wildlife policy are that um, problem animals are widespread, and in general, the best approach is really to try and minimize the damage they cause. The policy believes that you cannot eliminate uh, the damage completely. You can only minimize. Uh, but he also recognizes that um, if there is a value to some of these problem animals, maybe the sustainable use of those uh, problem animals should be encouraged. Now, the Wildlife Act vests the Uganda Wildlife Authority with the mandate to monitor and control problem animals. And our friend Agri here, that's the organization he comes from, whenever there are problem animal issues in Uganda, Uganda Wildlife Authority is called upon um, to see whether they can solve the problem. So um, I just briefly mention some of the approaches that are currently used in Uganda to reduce the human ape conflict. Uh, there is the best practice guidelines, which uh, was lying on the table there, and which many of you have a copy of now. Um, has guidance on how you could reduce conflict. And um, various methods have been used, as was mentioned earlier by Tanya. Guarding is one of them. Uh, some people use scarecrows, live hedges, creation of buffer zones. You've heard about all this before. Or adoption of alternative crops, chasing in the case of gorillas in Windy. Um, but um, those are the uh, procedures that are used in general. However, there are approaches that are not commonly used, but which, have been which were mentioned by Tanya in the morning. Um, education and awareness is one of these things. Um, and I, you know, as I said, most of these things were mentioned. You know, if you don't understand the biology and behavior of great apes, sometimes that lack of understanding exacerbates the conflict with apes. So you find that uh, programs of education and awareness undertaken by a number of agencies, 
both government and non-government. And um, these programs are aimed at making people understand wildlife, including apes. Uh, we do, for example, as an organization, have what we call forest education centers in two forests. And what happens at those places is that kids, school kids, are brought in from the surrounding schools uh, to these centers and um, taken through a structured program for a day. And it's amazing that these kids live next to the forest, but they don't know anything about what happens in the forest. Uh, they, don't, they have uh, misconceptions about wildlife, misconceptions about apes. And so we think that if people begin to understand then they'll appreciate uh, some of the issues that are connected with uh, wildlife. There are a number of institutions, such as ITFC, um, where Douglas comes from, uh, McKay University Biological Field Station, and others. All these stations are based in forests, and they do carry out some form of education and awareness programs in their proximity. Now, ecotourism, um, is another approach. Um, we believe that when ecotourism is used uh, in a good way, it can be used to improve the welfare of local people. These local people will be able to appreciate the value of wildlife better if they are benefiting from the ecotourism. And we think they can be less hostile to incursions on their land once they receive benefits. So um, there are a number of programs that run in Uganda. The Uganda Wildlife Authority runs programs based on gorilla tourism, as you are aware, and also on chimpanzee tourism. Uh, the National Forestry Authority also has some um, chimpanzee-based tourism in two forests. Uh, we've not been able to assess the effectiveness of these programs in reducing conflict. But, you know, circumstantial evidence shows that uh, there is greater tolerance of great apes at the sites where there is tourism. On that side, I just wanted to show you what happened at Budongo. Um, Budongo, okay. Yeah, that's just one of the cabins that was constructed by JGI in Budongo Forest. And these are the people who were recruited from the local community to act as guides. Um, now, this is an education center in Budongo. There are two sites in Budongo where there was ecotourism, chimp-based tourism. One is called Busingiro, and the other one is called Kanio Pabidi. Now, JGI discouraged NFA from pursuing ecotourism at uh, Busingiro, basically because it's at the edge of the forest. And we thought that if they encouraged ecotourism, it would increase conflict with the community. because well, these chimps are just next to the community. So instead, we set up this education center, and people can go there and do other forms of tourism, heavy tourism, but not chimpanzee tourism. So instead, uh, we shifted it to deeper in the forest at Kanio Pabidi to reduce possible conflict. The dance uh, ladies here, we shows you just some of, the, of this center, things that are happening. That was then in the, the minister of the this one here, and that was the is, uh, administrator of innovation from Lindy Washington. Let's call this Lindy. center. It's not because a project. It was funded by uh, American money. Uh, this, of course, is a picture, classic picture of Windy, and you see the the sharp edge between the community and the forest. Um, and this shows you just some of the things that are happening in Budongo. But this one here is uh, an in innovation at Bulindi. The place is called Bulindi. It's not a protected area. Uh, there are fro forest fragments there with uh, chimpanzees in them. So some years ago, the community approached the Jane Goodall Institute and said, look, we've heard that uh, People can track chimpanzees and make money. Can you guys come and help us and habituate these chimps so that we can make money? And we told them, well, um, 
we don't think that's really a viable option because if we habituate those chimps, it's going to get worse for you. These chimps will be moving right up to your homes. So they said, well, what do we do? These chimps are a menace. They're eating our cocoa. They're doing all this. And yet we are told we shouldn't kill them. So we came up with the idea of uh, a cafe, a roadside cafe. So this is actually uh, to certainly be open this year. It's a roadside cafe on the road between Masindi and Hoima. It's a tourist route. We think that uh, uh, if the community are trained uh, to manage this cafe, three, uh, four of them are currently being trained on the job by one of the lodge owners in Uganda. Uh, they'll, this thing is uh, being constructed with funds from a number of sources, JGI, Disney, um, various European donors. So it's going to be ready this year and the community will be managing it. The idea is that the resources they obtain from managing this cafe will compensate uh, for the tourism which they wanted. Because we said, you know, you can't go into tourism, it's going to co cause more problems for you. Yeah. So we hope that uh, presumably this idea will work. The issue of livelihoods, uh, again, was mentioned. Many of these people do not tolerate uh, incursions by wildlife onto their land because it's interfering with their livelihood options. Uh, we think that uh, that tolerance can be improved if farmers are given options, different options. Uh, again, we have an example of a project we are implementing currently in Hoima district um, with CEDA support. We are working in seven villages and we provided things which you wouldn't expect a typical conservation organization to be providing, but we think that in the long run it is useful. So we've been giving a borehole to each village, protected springs, training in improved land use management, construction of energy saving stoves, and we've also put their village tree nurseries uh, because we are trying to re-establish actually a corridor between two forests. Uh, there are riverine forests that were, were degraded by the community. We've convinced them to be able to replant at least 30 meters on either side of the river, the streams. It wasn't easy at the beginning because they thought we were trying to steal their land, uh, but eventually they, they accepted and they are actually, um, they're actually working on that quite fast. So those are some of the interventions. Um, this is a so-called um, improved breed of goat. So we, uh, some uh, people have got goats. This is a protected spring. Uh, that's a village nursery. That's an improved fireplace in the kitchen in the area. This is an area that is being replanted. That's the stream across. And 30 meters on either side, people are replanting trees. Um, research. Uh, in the morning, we heard about research. One of the unintended consequences of research uh, is the fact that research assistants are often recruited from the neighboring community. They go back there, they talk, and in so doing, they spread awareness. Uh, because they are talking to their fellow villagers. The sites gather information on conflict situations. They always come up with uh, ways of intervening. Uh, CTPH was talked about, you know, what it has been doing in Bwindi. Um, I thought I should also mention a few other activities. The Jen Goodall Institute often gets involved uh, in behalf of UA in interventions to rescue distressed chimpanzees, chimpanzees that have been caught in snares. Um, and one of the outcomes of, of that has been that um, last year, no, it was the year before, 2010, there was a female chimp which was caught in a snare. No, it's a man trap, you know, these huge traps that close like that. Uh, it was about a five year old. Um, our team went and they found that the, the leg had actually, the bone had been crushed. 
So they just couldn't treat it and leave it. So they had to bring it to uh, Entebbe, to the Wildlife Education Quarantine Center. And it was kept there for about a month. The leg was amputated. That's why it's called Mugu Moja. Uh, and it was reintroduced it's because it's female. And it's integrated very well. But since then, uh, people have been reporting to us presence of man traps. I mean, people were touched when they saw what happened to this chimp. And they thought, oh, it's not a very great thing to do. So uh, similarly, the snare removal program also uh, does teach people um, to appreciate that maybe the things they do are not quite appropriate. Finally, there are a few challenges. Uh, you know, challenges include there's no adequate involvement of communities when these interventions are being made. Of course, land use is changing at the expense of wildlife habitat. Resources for problem animal management are not adequate. Sensitization and awareness is still needed. Um, monitoring, we need to monitor the great ape incursions into community land so as to establish the seasonality, uh, movement patterns in order to understand the problem better. There's also the perception by communities that they do not benefit from wildlife. And so we need to work on that perception so that people begin to realize that they can benefit from wildlife. And of course, there is a problem at the district level in that they do not have the resources to deal with problem animal uh, issues. Thank you very much.